So it's my pleasure to, to introduce George Silverman from Brandon, who will talk about the dimensional complexity of Russian maps and laws. Well, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, so, I know that a lot of people in the audience probably are actually dynamical systems people, so I apologize that I am going to be trying to find things to the people who are also. Um, so, uh, just to start with invitation, standard thing with dynamics at the end. The function from the subset to the south, which is the iteration. Um, and I want to start with talking about sort of dynamical complexity, although this will sort of be the algebraic geometry version of complexity, um, but still um, important. Uh, and let me just consider first polynomial maps. And the simplest polynomial maps would be one variable. Um, to simplify things. Um, over any field you want, let's say the complex numbers. Um, and if you think of F as a map, probably the coarsest possible invariant to study, but still important, is its degree. Right? So, We'll use this degree as a way of studying how complicated it is, and the degree of f of this d, and if I iterate, well, it's d squared, and if I iterate n times the degree of d to the edge by plugging it into itself, and this is very boring. So, um, since that's boring, let's go watch the two variable case. But now if I want to iterate, I need two polynomials with two variables. So let me let f be f1 and f2, where f1 and f2 are polynomials in two variables. <laughs> and Again, let me, um, I, I'm going to just look at the degree of these polynomials. So the degree of f, say, is just the maximum of the degree of the uh, two polynomials. And the degree of a polynomial is just look at all the monomials in it and take the one that has highest exponents on it. And now, um, as probably most people are aware, the degree, say, of the second iterate often is not the square of the degree. And things get much more interesting. So the simplest example I know of, probably others, is just f of xy is xy x. So f has degree 2, right? So that's the xy term. F squared is um, x squared y, x y, so degree 3. F cubed is um, x cubed y squared, x squared y, degree 5, and so on. I mean, easy enough to see the pattern, it's easy enough to prove the pattern. But like, this is a nice exercise if you're teaching a how to do proofs course and trying to teach them induction. So let me discover it and prove that it's right. So the, the degree of f the n here is the n plus second Fibonacci number. And writing it like this is a very bad idea. I really do need the parentheses. Um, so roughly, right, the uh, degree of the the end iterates roughly the golden ratio raised to the end power. Okay. Um, so let me jump from there to sort of the general setup of rational functions. 
So let's consider an n tuple. No. Uh, yeah, capital n tuple. Uh, functions each of which is a rational function of n variables. Okay. Um, so roughly after the map from Cn to Cn, well, or I mean, or projective space if you want to think of it that way. And it's not quite defined everywhere, right? There's a might be a sublocus where it's not defined. I'll kind of ignore that. Um, I'm going to assume that these maps are well algebraic geometry terms dominant. So F1 through Fn um, do not satisfy any non-trivial polynomial relation. And that would mean that, that sort of, if you take all the points where it's defined, you get most of the points in the image. And iteration behaves nicely. Um, and again, I want to measure how complicated F is and its iterates are um, by something like this degree, which is a relatively coarse and varying. Um, maybe I should have mentioned that the degree here, when I'm taking sort of the max of the degrees of the polynomials, uh, there's another natural degree, the topological degree. You just take take a point and see how many generic points, see how many points are on in the inverse image, which is not what we're doing here. What we're really kind of doing is we're taking a, a line in the image and seeing how complicated the pullback is. So that's, that's the uh, thing to do here. I'm going to define the degree of this map f to be the following. Just sort of in, in here, take a hyperplane. H. Okay. Sort of a generic hyperplane. And take the inverse image of that hyperplane. Well, you'll get some hypersurface. And I just want to use the degree of that hypersurface as an algebraic variety, or alternatively, just intersect it with um, sort of n minus one more generic hypersurfaces. And you'll just get a bunch of points. If you do this generically, there's no multiplicity, so you just take the number of points there. Okay. So the h1 through h n minus one hyperplanes? Hyperplanes. These are all, all planes. So these are all linear things. You just want to see how complicated the one is. So alternatively, an object down to the F star of the structure C for Pn is OPN of this degree. It's, it's, it's sort of algebraic. But it also, you can simply think of it as the, the biggest degree of the polygonals that come up roughly. Um, and it gives a measure of the complexity of such a map. And now the question in dynamics, of course, is what happens to a complexity like that when we start iterating it? Um, and it's not so hard to prove lemma maybe, that, I mean, in fact, if you take two maps and you iterate them, the degrees is sub-multiplicative. You, you can't ever get more than the product of the degrees, but you can get less, as the example that the Fibonacci one shows you, where the Fibonacci, where the, that map over there, taking them both f, had to be 2, but the composition only had degree 3. So it can, can decrease. Um, but using this inequality, it's relatively easy to prove that um, the following limit exists, and it's called the dynamical degree. standard notation, I tend to use delta sub f. And when you do, I mean, it's a natural kind of thing. I mean, from this lemma, it's clear that if you iterate n times, the degree 
at most gets raised to the end of power. So it's natural to take an end through here and see how fast the thing increases. And that's what we do. Given of the degree of the end iterate, and take the end here. As I said, using this inequality is an exercise to prove that this converges. Um, and actually, um, you heard him talk about this two weeks ago, right, from Ken Powell. Um, which when I noticed this title, I was very happy you actually videoed it so I could see what he had done <laughs> so that I could kind of, uh, well, not, not repeat much of what he said, but um, kind of tie it in a little bit. I mean, he, he was looking at mostly maps um, in dimension two. And even there, there's all kinds of open problems, but there's also a fair amount known. Um, in general, there's far more problems than there's known. But there are also intermediate, um, sort of intermediate dynamical degrees. Here, here we took the inverse image of a hyperplane. If you take the inverse image of a generic point, you just get the topological degree of the map, the number of points the inverse image. And you'll get sort of a zero dimensional dynamical degree. This is the n minus one dimensional, the co dimension one. And if you take this to be a, linear subspace of some intermediate co-dimension, you get a whole sequence of these dynamical degrees. The whole sequence is quite interesting. But the only one I know how to do an arithmetic analog of is this one, so we're going to talk about the others. Um, so these dynamical degrees, um, which also log delta S is sometimes called the uh, algebraic entropy. Um, well, if you take a hypersurface of degree k, you'll just end up multiplying everything by k. It's homological. Yeah, it's homological. If you, if you take a hypersurface instead of h, the hypersurface is homologous to k times a hyperplane. And the intersection theory really is just a homology invariant. But then if you apply f composite g star. Yeah. <laughs> That doesn't make it's not because of G star F star. No, no, F, no, F, F, uh, uh, yeah, no, F, it, in terms of its action on homology, F G star, in fact, is not G star F star, in general, for, for rational maps. If, if you look at maps that are defined everywhere, so morphisms, then yet this is true, and this whole thing becomes very boring because um, this n actually does come out and cancel. So this is really interesting for rational maps that are morphisms. Yeah. Um, the arithmetic analog actually though is interesting even for morphisms. Um, okay. So this was um, this dynamical degree, as far as I was, was kind of first studied by Gusikowski uh, and, and Schiffman and also Arnold um, in the 1960s, and then. Oh, I'm sorry, 1990s. I need the glasses. Um, and the conjecture of the long Uh so in the 1990s, which um, is the delta sub f is always an algebraic integer. In other words, it's a root of a monic polynomial. coefficients in Z. Um, it is not at all clear from that definition that it's a, an algebraic number. Um, right? Limits like that tend to be transcendental. Um, I think, though well, maybe I'm doing them injustice, that they made this conjecture based on something else they thought was true. Namely, it, I mean, taking that limit is certainly worth doing. It's an interesting invariant. But one could simply look at this sequence of integers and ask if it has some sort of regularity to it. So, for example, I, I think at the time they thought that this sequence would always satisfy a uh, linear recursion. 
like the Fibonacci sequence does. And if it does, then you get this conjecture for free. Uh, it turns out that that hope is not true. But, but that conjecture is known for surfaces. So okay. The conjecture is now known for surfaces. That's what Kantap was talking about pretty much, yeah. Uh, oh, for automorphism to surfaces. So, by rational mass, mass would have a rational inverse. Yeah, I don't think it's known for general rational maps, even for surface. I don't think it's even known for rational maps with P2, in fact. Um, yeah, so, this is a result of the Hazel Blackie product. So, I mean, the, if you want to look at rational maps that aren't actually morphisms, the probably the easiest ones to look at are, are like that example I did in dimension two, which are what are called monomial maps, where each polynomial is just a single term. Um, so they look at monomial maps, which are maps of the form, so the first function is x1, e11, X1, EN1, and so on. XN. Uh, XN, yeah. It'd be easier if they were all X1s. Um, yeah. Q, and so on. Uh, uh, XN, EN. I'm sorry, can I just. Uh, so you definitely don't want X1 in the third. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I do. I want x forms through x ends in all the variables. <laughs> A general monomial in each thing. Where, where the EIJs are integers. Um, and the condition that the map be dominant, that it basically be one to, is that the determinant of the uh, matrix with the EIJ shouldn't be zero. Okay. And what they proved is there exists such F such that the degree of F to N is not a linear recursion. In fact, not a finite union of linear recursions in any regular way. Um, what ends up happening is, is there are, a, well, maybe I shouldn't quite say, that there are a finite number of linear recursions, but the number of terms you take from the first one before you switch to the second one varies in a quite random looking manner, having to do with the, the, the decimal expansion of an irrational number. Um, so the conjecture is not going to be provable by proving that you get has any recursions. Um, on the other hand, the, the conjecture is true for um, for monomial maps because, in fact, what they proved was the delta sub f is the largest eigenvalue of the, the matrix of exponents. So it's a special matrix. Is to say that there's no linear recursion saying if you cook up a generating function, it's not rational? It's yes, rational. that would be another way to say it. Yeah, maybe that's a better way to say it. The generating function, they, they proved that for, they give some examples, other people have shown there are a lot of examples, that the generating function in the sequence of integers is not a rational function. Some of the dynamics and geometry, algebraic geometry, kind of geometry, meaning with polynomials. Um, so what about doing something analogous in the number theoretic setting? The idea being that we'll take our um, 
rational functions say to have rational um, co uh, coefficients. And I'll, t I'll take a point. with rational coordinates and look at the forward orbit. So that's just P F of P F squared P is L. And ask how complicated in the number theoretic sense are the points in the orbit. Okay. So the first question is what does it mean to say something is complicated number theoretically versus uncomplicated. Um, so, which of those numbers is more complicated? Well, if you're building a bridge and um, you're using this as a measurement, they're the same. Right? If you're doing real analysis, I know they're not the same, but they're pretty darn close. But number theoretically, they're very different. This one is far more complicated as a number. Um, and at least one way to think about uh, complexity of numbers is, at least in the modern formulation, would be how many bits does it take to store it on a computer? So that's a good way to to do it. Um, the word that's used in number theory, which has a long history, is height rather than complexity. So, the height of a number is roughly the number of bits to specify it. Specify it, stored on the computer, whatever you like. Um, so for in, an integer, this is number, will take the height, this can be the definition if you like, just to be the log that's after the height. I should use log 2 because it's bits. I should add 1 in case you want to specify plus or minus. But this is up to a constant multiple. This is the number of bits it takes to store A on a computer. Okay. Half that, twice that, doesn't really matter for what we're going to do. Um, more generally, if you have a rational number like this, which, of course, we buy our fractions in lowest terms, then I'll just define the, hold on here. Then I'll define the height of P to be, I mean, you, have, you could take the largest of the logs, or, or you could add the logs, but you've got to do the, the numerators and the denominators separately. Um, and this, this is not the standard definition, but it's close enough for, for what we're going to do. Um, and any, pretty much any two definitions, if you had definition one and definition two, then definition one would be greater than or equal to a constant times definition two, and less than or equal to some other constant, right? The other thing. And what we're going to do, these constants will cancel out. So, the intuition is what the height of the point is the arithmetic complexity is how many bits it takes to describe its coordinates. Um, one thing that this complexity should have, I mean, it's kind of an information theoretic complexity also, for the scientists, um, is if you, but, well, what, what we tend to come up with, well, what happens if we have a set whose complexity is bounded? Okay, how big is it? So, how big I'm going to answer with either finite or infinite rather than actually counting. Um, and I mean, it's a trivial. Not over there, right? If you look at the points whose height is less than some bound, this is twice. 
Because if you bound the height, you're bounding the numerators and the denominators and their integers. You only find many integers less than any given bound. Okay. So now let's look at orbits. And the key question is, how fast does the complexity grow? As we look at the points in the orbit. So how fast does it grow as a function of the n? And we can get a rough idea. Well, first, it might not grow at all. Right? I mean, suppose p is a fixed point for this map. Okay, it's just fixed. Um, but we can get an idea of sort of the fastest it could possibly grow. Because if you think about it, it I mean, the coordinates of f of p. So, F is, uh, I guess, well, yeah, over here. So F is just all these rational functions, the ratios of polynomials, um, which are just sums of monomials. Um, so the coordinates of F of P basically can't really be much bigger than some, well, maybe some constant that depends on F times the coordinates of, uh, of P itself raised to the degree of F power. Because the, the, the monomials that appear in those rational functions basically have degree less than or equal to this, so you're raising these numbers. So just an example, x squared y plus y over x plus y cubed. Is that the, the height of the coordinates? No, this isn't the height. Of, this is just for the absolute the map. Right. This is yeah. This is just the absolute value of the coordinate. No, not the height. To take the height actually going to be a big lot. Um, if you plug, you know, x equals a over b here and y equals c over d, um, you see, you kind of get things to cube powers, things to cube powers, and you clear denominators with these and with these. But, but you'll never get like an a to the fourth or an a squared b squared. Um, you won't get fourths. So most of them get a four, four cubes. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> because this actually, when you dehomogenize it, uh, no, I'm sorry, when you homogenize it. Yeah, yeah, because you square the a of anyway. Whatever the degree is, is what it will come out. This is why I want you to make up examples on the fly, right? That would be my guess. Um, but as was just pointing out, um, the the coordinates are getting raised to this power, so the number of bits gets multiplied by that power. So roughly. And uh, this is, again, a relatively easy proposition. If the height of f of p is less than or equal to a constant that depends on f times the height of p. Well, that's another constant. If you want to be careful. In essence, this ends up being a triangle really inequality. That's what's proved. Oh, sorry. Constant of f of Constant there. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This constant comes into the triangle of inequality you take it on. <laughs> um, so if we iterate, um, roughly, although the constant is a little bit annoying, the height of F the N shouldn't be, I, I mean, doesn't get too much bigger than the degree of F to the N. So again, this suggests, just as with the dynamical degree, that the, the way to study how fast that's growing is to take the n truth and see what happens. Okay. So the arrow 
kinetic degree. And of course, the, here there are two things to go into with the map app and the point is orbit you're taking, okay? So of the f orbit of a point P, I'll do another alpha sub f of P, and it's, it's just what I just, just said. We take the complexity of f to the n of P. Take its end through. Unfortunately, um, well, more or less because of this constant here that comes in, I don't even know how to prove this exists. But that shouldn't stop us from, uh, from using it, right? But so you can take lim soup at one limit. Yeah, lim soup's probably more interesting. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a theorem about which of lim soup in a couple of minutes. Um, but again, I just want to read The intuition here is that to describe the coordinates of the n figurate of f applied to p takes roughly alpha of f of p to the n. So it's an arithmetic complexity or information theoretic complexity invariant of this organ. For like For large, yeah. Yes. Um, so here are four more that is for these binomial maps. Is that easier to choose for the binomial maps? I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Yes, excellent question. <laughs> so let me say the conjecture first, which I can then prove, which I can prove for my own. Is the statement that is asymptotic a theorem? No, that's why I said take roughly. No, it's, it's not, not going to be asymptotic. It's just you get a little low in the exponent or something. Just, just, just whatever this limit existing says. Um, so, conjecture one is that alpha f of p exists as a limit. Um, Second conjecture, which I mean, maybe my best hope of, of, of saying this is plausible is simply by analogy, um, is that alpha sub f of p is an algebraic integer. Third, um, in this case we have the interesting possibility of, for a fixed map f, we can start with different points and get different orbits and ask how, diff how many different sorts of complexities can there be. And conjecture is that there are only finitely many possibilities for this arithmetic degree, for a fixed F. And the fourth part of the conjecture, which seems to be the deepest of the four, um, actually needs one piece of preliminary. Um, and it's a question, how big can the arithmetic complexity of an order P. Right. So some natural upper bound, and the answer is yes. In fact, the arithmetic complexity of the orbit is never larger than the dynamical degree, so the geometric complexity of the map. Um, this is not really the theorem 
that one wants because we don't know these limits exist. So in fact, what, what one can prove is that the limit soon, in fact, satisfies that. So if the limit exists, you get it also. Um, and of course, any time you get a theorem like this, one wants to ask when you get equality. When is the arithmetic complexity of an orbit maximized? And the conjecture is that if the orbit is what's called the risky depth, which I'll define in a second, then the arithmetic complexity of the orbit is in fact maximal. What is the risky depth? So risky dense means there does not exist a non-zero polynomial that vanishes on every point in the order, such that f of q equals zero for all points in the order. So it's a, it's a way of saying that the points in the orbit really spread out reasonably well over the whole space. Uh, it's not nearly as strong as saying that the orbit is dense in a complex topology or something like that, not even close. But it's, it's the usual, uh, well, it's sort of the basic topology that's used in algebraic geometry. Uh, and actually, of course, the way the theorem is stated, it's good that this is a topology, right? Because for a set to be Zariski dense is actually not that strong a condition. And then it has this strong conclusion. Oh, but I mean, the, the points that, uh, that do not be Zariski dense, they form like the counter of the and stuff like that. Yeah, well. Yeah, it's that's a very good question. I don't know. Actually, people let me get away with something at the beginning, um, which maybe I'll take a minute now and point out. I said, you know, take, take a point in Q to the N and look at its, you know, look at the iterates of F applied to P. Well, F isn't defined everywhere. F, F is defined by rational functions. So in general, um, There'll be a, an indeterminacy locus in here, which, I mean, they'll have co-dimension at least two, but you have this indeterminacy locus. Well, um, and I want points so that the iterates never land in this indeterminacy locus. Well, over the complex numbers, there are lots of such points, the easy argument. But Q is countable. So in principle, every single starting point could eventually land in the indeterminacy locus. And if that happens, the conjecture is true vacuously because there are no points it applies to. Okay. Um, actually, that doesn't happen. And one would think that was pretty obvious, and in fact, it's a rather deep theorem. Um, to the, um, didn't look up the date. This is not very many years ago. This is, this is you know, 2000. Um, that says that um, basically the set of starting points says that the full orbit is defined is big. So say it is a risky guess. And the proof uses stuff from logic and model theory and a fairly deep theorem of Grushovsky's. Um, so, I mean, this is very nice because it means these conjectures and things aren't backwards. Um, but one needs that to, to get anywhere. Um, let me mention another um, justification for um, this definition of the arithmetic degree. In number theory, when one has an interesting set that's infinite, um, one still likes to try to count how big it is. So um, 
this, if this orbit, this orbit's infinite, but it, it has only finitely many points, um, say, of, of, of height less than some constant. I mean, pick any constant. Um, this is a finite set, because in fact, there are only finitely many points altogether of bounded height. And we can try to count the ones within this orbit. And they ask asymptotically how fast does this grow. So, again, this, this is not a real hard theorem, but, um, let me go for a proposition. So, if this arithmetic degree exists, then it exactly gives the growth rate for this in the following sense, is the limit as p goes to infinity of the number of points in the orbit of height less than b over log b. Um, well, what you ask is log of this arithmetic degree. So that's what, I, I think it was Arnold who called this the, the arithmetic uh, entropy. Anyway, the log of that. Well, I'm sorry, we dealt with that here. Um, so this would be another way to come up with this invariant, um, simply looking at a very natural counting question, at least for, for a number of theorists, this is a very natural sort of counting question. Um, okay. So, so what's new? Well, theorem that um, the conjecture is true for monomial maps. And actually, even part D is even true in a stronger form. Um, the thing is, a monomial map and it's just given by the binomials. If you think of it as a map from C star multiplicative group, well, product of a power of the multiplicative group, which is notoriously so. It's a homomorphism. An algebraic homomorphism of, of an algebraic group. Um, and what's true for part D in this case it's easier to state it with the contrapositive. If the arithmetic degree is strictly less than the dynamical degree, then not only is the orbit of the point not so risky dense, it's contained in a proper algebraic subgroup. Of this n dimensional. Yes, yes. I mean, not to make your option this is an n dimensional torus, but I think. I'm sorry. For it's people that have. C of the N or C. Oh, C star of the N. And the proof, I, I mean, the proof is a whole bunch of calculations with height functions and stuff like that. But then at one point, kind of in the middle, uh, it uses Baker's theorem of linear forms of logarithms. Um, and I can't help thinking that it shouldn't need such a big hammer, but I don't know how to eliminate it. Um, so what I'd like to use the last few minutes to do is to talk about how all of this generalizes to a much more general setting, okay? So first, instead of Q, you can use a number field. In other words, a finite extension of Q. But more importantly, you don't just have to work in projective space, okay? So um, the rest of the talk is, is joint work. Uh, the shoot how we shoot. And I'm going to give some definitions by analogy, which I hope is okay. I think that there's stuff in algebraic geometry. 
Um, but hopefully, it, it's generalizations of what I've been talking about. So I'll just sort of do it with my analogy with that. So instead of using projective space, or, 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 or just C to the N or Q to the N, which are affine spaces, well, generally, I want to use a projective variety. So, let me let x in the n be a non-singular projective variety. Which simply means it's a zero set of a bunch of homogeneous polynomials. And when you look at the complex points, you get a, a manifold. Okay? Um, and since I want to iterate functions, I'm going to look at a map from x to itself. So, this is going to be a dominant of roughly the dominant, a dominant rational. So, rational map just means by that given by rational functions, ratios of polygonal. Is your x defined over k? Um, yeah, I would. Well, okay. for the arithmetic part, yes. For the dynamics part, the beginning over c. Um, dominant. Well, since it's given by rational functions, you might have points where things aren't defined because of denominators. So there's some indeterminacy locus. But if you take away that indeterminacy locus, then the image is dense. Okay, it's a risky dense. Accurate, I Do I need to put it reducible? I guess I don't. If it's reducible, where are the intersections? Singular. Um, okay. Or alternatively, the, the image has the right dimension. So it's mostly one to, which means you can. Now, how should we define the dynamical degree in this set? It's a little tricky. I mean, but the dynamical degree should be, I take f, I iterate it n times, I take the degree, and I take the x root. But what's the degree of a map, of a general manifold? You can do, it, 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 if you map in the outbreak, I'm just thinking of it as a, a complex manifold. This can be embedded in projective space. Are you saying that x is projective or x is in a projective space to be ended? No, I'm saying x is projective. So you have to fix the hyperplane section, huh? No, well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm taking a... So then you can pull back that kind of like that. Um, yes, I could take a hyperplane section here and pull it back there. That's true. Um, but I don't actually want to do that because that's making things depend on which embedding I choose all sets. Yes, I don't really want it to depend on the embedding. Um, so, but the, those hyperplane sec, I, I mean, well, hyperplane sections are co-dimension two um, thing. So, So I don't know whether people like cohomology better or yeah, it's a better. I don't need cohomology. So, so let's just look at H two of X. A hyperplane in X will correspond to an element of H lower two. Right? It's a it's a codimension two thing. One complex codimension, so two real codimensions. Um, it's a little easier to use uh, homology instead of homology. Um, and that map F will induce a linear transformation here. Okay, this is the finite dimensional vector space. In fact, when I, I kind of want to throw out H2 here and H0 and 2 if there are, but I really want to use H1 and 1. But we'll ignore that too. Um, Finite dimensional complex vector space linear transformation. 
So the analog of the green will simply be the large cyberdyne. If this is one dimensional, which it is when X is projective space, then you simply get the degree of the math in the way that I defined it before. Okay? So what we're going to do is define the degree of F, uh, of rho of F, is the spectral radius of the induced linear transformation on cohomology. The second cohomology. And then the dynamical degree is um, you look at the spectral radius of the map induced by the nth iterate and the nth root. The key thing here, of course, is that the map induced by the nth iterate in general is not the nth iterate of the linear map induced by f. There's also the issue that the... Well, no, no, I'm not that way. Is there a question? No, okay, fine. Maybe that answers your question. Um, and one has the same conjecture. The delta sub f is now a Um, for arbitrary varieties. Uh, now, I will grant you that on projective space, it's really easy to find lots of self-maps, interesting self-maps. On most varieties, not so easy. And, um, and in fact, most of the interesting ones I know that aren't on projective space, they tend to be automorphisms. Um, projective space doesn't have it, really have interesting automorphisms. I should say that. What the, and rational emotions, but not actual emotions. But um, there are a lot of varieties that have very interesting automorphisms, which we can define everywhere. Um, D2 surfaces, or uh, the hours and things. Um, and this dynamical degree is a very interesting narrative to try to try to compute in those cases. Um, okay. So, now, let me do what Rob was suggesting. Let, let's take K to be a number field and X to be defined over K, by which I mean the equations that define F have coefficients in K. And uh, little F, you define it, you mean the polynomials that define the math F also have coefficients in and if you want to give the cables Q, but there is a way to define heights or arithmetic complexity on finite extensions of Q. Um, and then one use the same definition, alpha f of P is the limit of the complexity of P to 1 over X. What height do I mean here? Well, I kind of, at the beginning, I fixed, I, I defined x as sitting in projective space. So I just used the height of the, I mean, the point of x is a point of projective space. I just used that. So it looks like this depends on which embedding, in fact, it doesn't. Okay, so one can prove that if you embed this variety x in some other projective space in some other way, um, you get the same value if the limit exists, which we don't have. Um, but, the limit, but if you take it in suit, you get the same values. Um, conjectures A through D, I won't write them again, they're identical. If the limit exists, the value is an arithmetic integer, you only get finitely many values as you vary P. And if the orbit is big enough, then in fact, the arithmetic degree equals the dynamical degree. So let me just finish with a theorem that Shu and I just got done, done proving fairly recently. Well, it says several parts. First, 
Um, it's the same inequality. That the arithmetic degree is always bounded by the dynamic degree, even with a lint suit. Second, um, if F is amorphism, meaning it's everywhere defined, then, then parts A, B, and C are true. Meaning, how the, the arithmetic degree exists, it's an algebraic integer, it takes only finitely many values. And if X is what's called an Abelian variety, which means it has a group law on it, then D is also true. The map F will automatically be amorphous in a So A three B are all true. Um, And this turns out to be relatively easy if, um, if, if, if the cohomology that you use um, is just one dimensional. But if it gets, it's, it's quite tricky if it gets, if the cohomology is bigger than one. In other words, if they're two independent, um, two or more independent divisors in terms of intersection theory. Um, this involves sort of the generalization of the theory of canonical heights to, to Jordan blocks. And this um, uses a bunch of the structure theory relating uh, self maps of abelian varieties to divisors of abelian varieties. Um, there's a whole big geometric theory of that that is fairly classical. And then one translates that into height function theory and does some calculations. Um, which I mean, I was wondering. I was wondering. So, so which are the varieties for which, like this theory is interesting? Maybe Arabians, Jesuits, or um, yeah, I, I, I mean, mean, besides the rational varieties, um. Yeah, varieties with um, trivial canonical bundle, varieties and things, um, many of them do have uh, interesting rational amorphisms. Um, so, and also, well, the arithmetic theory isn't so interesting unless it's system is bigger than one, otherwise we just put one. But, uh, but you can get, you can get, um, Put more systems of positive, of dynamic degree greater than one. Um, K3s in particular, there are several classes of K3s that have polymorphisms where delta sub f is strictly bigger than one. And then if we know uh, that f is integrable in some sense, for instance, has some large uh, number of uh, invariant surfaces or something, then is there some uh, statement about uh, the bound for uh, the arithmetic? Uh, I think, in fact, if the, the, the examples I'm familiar with where the, where f is integrable tend to have that out of the degree one. What about the and, 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 and this is always very big one, so, so they just all be one. So, um, in, in those cases, so what, 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 what kind of statement is that? And what statement is that? I mean, um, it's just a, it's, it's examples that I've seen. The, 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 I, I mean, if the, if the math's integrable, then this degree tends not to grow exponentially. Is it, it, tend, it, tends, it tends to grow polynomially. So when you take the nth root, it, it, um, you, know, you, you just get one. But, but it, then becomes, it then becomes interesting to, um, to study the polynomial growth of this. Is it a theorem or is it kind of a belief? What, what uh, it's a belief from some of the examples that I've seen. Um, yeah. Um, but that's because a lot of the integrable examples seem to come from some generalization of taking elliptic surface and tra using the trans iterating a translation map. And those maps of degrees don't grow exponentially, they grow polynomial. Yeah. Um, and in those cases, the interesting thing to study from a 
to the arithmetic viewpoint, rather than taking the nth root of this, you want to find the correct constant and look at that limit. Um, and that leads to sort of a, a theory of canonical heights for those sorts of things, if the is favorable. Are there function field analogs of your conjecture? Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, characteristic zero function field of curve, one dimensional function field. I think it should all be fine. I'm always hesitant to say function fields over finite fields because there's often some counterexamples using Fabanius and things. There should be some version of it. It's true. Uh, but I haven't even saw that. Okay, so thank you again.